So let's look at channel estimation for mobile communications. And we're going to start with the narrowband channel. And here's the equation at baseband, where X is your transmitted data symbol, H is the channel, N is noise. And what we do to estimate the channel is we send training data. So we send data that the receiver already knows about. It already expects that data. So it knows what the symbol is and you just got to estimate the channel. So in this very simple case where it's a scalar uh, single symbol that's being sent, then the least squares estimate of the channel is given by Y divided by X. So in the baseband representation, you measure Y and you divide it by X, as I said, the receiver knows what the training data is, so it knows X, and this gives you an estimate of H. So let's look at maybe the earliest uh, um, digital mobile standard, which was the second generation GSM, and just look at what happens in that case. So in that case, the packet, the GSM packet is made up like this. There are, there's some header bits and some tail bits. There's 57 data bits, and in the middle of the packet, there's 26 training bits. So they don't just use one training symbol like we have here. Uh, there are 26 bits for training. And then there's 57 data symbols. So the reason it's in the middle of the packet is to account for any or to allow for a small amount of channel change in time during the time it takes to send that packet. So if you train in the middle, then you'll get the estimate of the channel in the middle and then it will be roughly right uh, at the start and at the end of the packet. Whereas if you'd trained at the start of the packet, it might be that by the time you got to the end, the channel might well be out of date because of time variations. So let's look at what this is now. We can write a vector version of this equation up here. So then we've got a vector, a measurement vector y. I'm going to put a tilde underneath it to represent the, um, that it's a vector. It's a 26 by 1 vector. So I'll put 26 by 1 here because there's 26 training bits. So if we're sending BPSK uh, in the training, then we're sending one symbol per bit. And this equals the channel, which we're assuming to be constant during that uh, period of this packet, uh, times the uh, vector of the symbols plus, of course, there's noise on each of those measurements. And in this case, the least squares estimate of H is given by uh, X vector uh, transpose. Again, it's training data, so you know what those symbols are at the receiver. It already knows to expect them uh, to the minus one uh, times X tilde transpose times Y. So this is the least squares estimate of the channel given 26 or more than one, uh, in this case 26, uh, training symbols. So this is how you estimate uh, if it's a constant channel. So let's think about uh, the more general case. So let's think about the fact that the channel does actually change with time uh, if we are going to be looking over longer time periods and we might want to be doing that. So here's, here's a, a, a drawing of just my hand sketch drawing of how the channel variation might happen. So this is the channel value H as a function of time. And so what we can look at this and do is we can think, well, let's think about actually sampling this. So here we could think of this as sampling. This is a sample. This is 26 samples every packet for GSM. What we could do if it's changing more quickly is we could be taking samples at a regular basis, a regular time interval, for example, and in between this, we can be sending data. I mean, this is what the GSM looks like if every time I'm drawing a vertical line here, you're thinking of 26 packets, so if, sorry, sorry, 26 bits. So if it's 26 training bits, or you could send one training bit, it's up to you. So now we can see as time uh, evolves and the channel changes with time, uh, we can send training at a regular interval. As I said, we can send data in between there. And now we can see that it becomes a sampling problem with interpolation. So uh, you could view this in GSM as one packet after another or in a more general ongoing continuous uh, transmission situation with a longer packet, uh, you could be interspersing your training data at regular intervals throughout that longer packet. And then you can see, well, effectively what you would be doing is if each time you sent a symbol, let's say this was one symbol each represented by the vertical lines here, one symbol at this time, then you would get an estimate of the channel for that one symbol at each of the times where there's a 
line here. So we could draw this like a sampling case. I'll just draw uh, deltas on the top of here to make them uh, indicate the idea of sampling. It, the channel is a continuous waveform and we are going to be sampling it at these discrete time intervals. And then of course it's interpolation that we need to do to recover the channel in between when we're actually sending data. So that then we can use that channel where we know the channel to estimate the data in between. Uh, and for videos on sampling, uh, check out the description below this video. Uh, also below this video, you'll find information about the rate of change of the channel, because how fast this channel changes is going to be important for us in terms of how regularly we have to send these training symbols in our, in our data symbol sequence. Of course, this is all narrowband. What about if we consider wideband as well? So in the frequency domain, we are also going to be having changes as a function of frequency. So if our, single, if our signal is a, a wideband signal, then we no, don't just have to think about the time variation, we have to think about the frequency variation as well. And so uh, what we have here is um, then we've got a, a sort of shape here, which is a multi-humped type shape where the channel varies as a function of uh, time as well as as a function of frequency. And so maybe I'll draw, just trying to, trying to draw a hand drawing here to show this uh, two-dimensional shape here where we're, we're now needing to also sample in the frequency domain. So how do we sample in the frequency domain? Well, this is in OFDM we have divided the frequency into subcarriers. And what we can do is we can send, uh, we can put pilot symbols in different subcarriers. And I think you can see here now, you can choose which subcarriers they are that you're going to send those pilot symbols in. Uh, and then in exactly the same way as in the time domain, we're now viewing in the frequency domain, we are going to be sampling in the frequency domain. Again, we will have an interpolation challenge in the frequency domain. And if we sample regularly in the frequency domain, then it's a regular uh, symbol, uh, uh, challenge of of, uh, of reconstruction interpolation, but we don't have to do regular sampling. And in fact, we don't have to just do it, of course, we don't have to do it separately in the time domain and the frequency domain. What we can do is a combination of both. And in 4G communications, the LTE standard, there is a resource block and where it divides up frequency and time uh, and so this is in the time direction. Uh, I'll just use that T for both this one and this picture. It's a time, if we look time here and frequency here, then these are all the sub-channels of OFDM and you can choose to uh, allocate certain sub-channels for uh, for sending training symbols, and often they're grouped together. Uh, there is an advantage to sending more than one, just like there was in GSM. So in time, you can repeat them after each other, uh, and then you can send at a later uh, time as well to get uh, two samples here to try to overcome the noise and get more accurate values at those times. Uh, and then of course, you're doing it at different frequencies as well. But you don't have to just pick um, a regular pattern like I've drawn here. You could pick any pattern and it would be a two-dimensional reconstruction problem. So you're putting pilot symbols, which you which your receiver already knows to expect at that time and at that frequency. And then the receiver does exactly this process here and then has a two-dimensional reconstruction challenge to do. Um, of course, uh, how often you do it as we said before, it depends on how much change there is in the time domain as well as how much change there is in the frequency domain. And these result, uh, these can be um, gauged by measures such as time coherence and frequency coherence for the channel. And uh, it can be that you spend up to a quarter of the resource blocks sending training data if the channel is varying very fast in either or both direction. So a quarter of your total time and frequency subchannels spend sending training. Uh, so that's quite an overhead, but you might need it. Um, another thing to point out uh, is that um, this you could do a decision directed approach as well. So if the channel is quite uh, quite um, good and there's not much noise, then if you're doing a good job of detecting your data in between these samples, then the data 
could also be used in a decision directed mode to add extra points in here for the interpolation. So that would be called decision directed uh, approach. Another thing to be thinking about is, uh, I'll just list some other things over here, uh, pilot contamination. Um, so you have to worry about um, uh, uh, when you get pilot symbols being sent in neighboring cells. So that's pilot contamination. Um, uh, so that's where, yes, as I said, the next nearest cell to you that uses the same frequency band, when they are sending their pilot symbols as well, they can be interfering with the pilot symbols, of course, in your cell. And this is called pilot contamination. So that's a challenge, especially in small cells, uh, especially with massive MIMO in small cells. Uh, another thing to be thinking about is that all of this assumes that we already have, I mean, we're doing what we call channel estimation, but even channel estimation assumes that some things have already happened first, and that's often from the header here. So these things are like synchronization. Uh, we have to assume that we've got our timing synchronized. Uh, we need to get timing recovery. Um, so that's where we're saying, so synchronization is where we've got our carrier synchronized, but timing recovery is knowing exactly what the times are when these resource blocks, when they're sending sim training symbols. So that's called timing recovery. Um, and uh, that's another thing we need to think about. And of course, phase locking as part of the synchronization. So uh, maybe I'll put uh, phase lock loop here. So we need the frequency right, but we need the phase right as well of our carrier. Um, and maybe the last thing to point out is that uh, we have, a, a, have to also think about whether we're doing time division duplexing versus frequency division duplexing. And in time division duplexing, because you're sending in one direction in the downlink for one period of time and then the uplink for the other period of time, you're using the same frequency band. So actually you only need to do channel estimation in one direction and then you can know that channel and use that channel value in the other direction. Whereas frequency division duplexing, the uplink and the downlink are using different parts of the frequency band and therefore in frequency division duplexing, you need to do channel training in both directions uh, on the uplink and the downlink. So hopefully this video has given you more insight into channel estimation. And uh, if you uh, liked it, please give it a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Of course, subscribe to the channel. There's many more videos on the channel. And in the description below, you'll find a web page where there's a full categorized listing of all the videos on the channel.